Thank you very much and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us. Uh, the sessions after lunch are always a little more difficult. We need to keep the attention of the audience going so this panel has a strong job to do. And uh, first of all, let's give all our panelists, uh, Mr. Bimlendu Jha, Omkar Goswami and R. Mukhanandan, a big round of applause. And of course, uh, the big focus right now, we're talking about the growth of the Indian economy, the transition and the key risks. I think everyone is very clear that India is on a strong and robust growth path. India is a strong alternative to China. And yes, many countries, many companies are betting on India as a supply chain partner, as an alternative manufacturing destination. But it is also said that this opportunity will not stay for India forever. Before we begin, I'd just like to quote uh, the former US Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers or Larry Summers, who was in India over the weekend here in New Delhi. He said, a combination of free market forces addressing energy related infrastructure question of reform in key states, supporting an effective public sector could generate an eightfold expansion in Indian economy by 2050. There are some common risks to the Indian economy we keep talking about. And I'm going to open this up right now with Mr. Mukundan. Uh, Mr. Mukundan, let me ask you about your outlook on India's growth. Uh, and if there were certain key risks, certain hurdles, certain policy issues that you see along the way, what would those be? Uh, thank you, Parikshit. Firstly, delighted to be here amongst all of you. And this is a very interesting topic and uh, really fit for purpose for post-lunch uh, session. Uh, if, if you look at the opportunity, I don't want to come from risk because really these are the opportunities India has. And I would put them in form of about three or four transition. First is there's a demographic transition around the world and that plays into economics, the base economics in any case. The second one we all know is energy transition. I think the benefit India has is 80% of our infrastructure is yet to be built. It's one thing to for a country which has already built the infrastructure to rewire it, change it for sustainable future. We can actually build ground up sustainably. So I think that's a big, big opportunity. It's very different from the way the rest of the world would look at it. It's like, uh, don't go through fixed wire, but I go through wireless straight away. The third is digital. Again, I think what we have shown Embracing digital wholeheartedly has delivered the goods already in many, many spaces. And that remains a great opportunity for us in terms of uh, what I would call as the uh, way forward, whether it's 10 years, 15, 20 years or so. And, and lastly, I, I think what we have is, is, is an ability to embrace pluralism. And uh, it, it's, it's a very uh, simplified word. I think what we tend to not sort of uh, believe in ourselves is that while Europe is still trying to figure out how to go together as one EU, we are almost like Europe in terms of size and differences and everything. But we've been doing this very successfully for 75 years with all imperfections and building upon that. And why is it so important? Because innovation happens when pluralism thrives. So really four big issues which are in our favor. And I, I, I think if we sort of continue the way we are continuing, uh, whatever is set out in the um, basic document or whatever is circulated, that India will double in about 10 years or so, doesn't look to be a different of the... There are, of course, challenges. You know, challenges are external to us, challenges that we may not embrace this fully, challenges that uh, we may, some of us may feel very diffident about these transitions and not really push ahead. So it is more coming from whether we are going to be confident, proactive, and engaging positively. Uh, policy predictability, that is something we were speaking of uh, off, this, off stage. And uh, in reference to that, Moody's Investor Service had very recently said that risk posed by reform and policy barriers to the pace of investments in India's manufacturing and infrastructure sectors. Complexity of decision making and bureaucracy reduces India's attractiveness as a destination for FDI. Uh, Mr. Jha, do you feel that if we want to grow as a big investment destination, if we want more manufacturing and capacities to be set up, we need policy predictability for the future and that's somehow uh, lacking in our ecosystem. Uh, no, it's okay. I've got the, I, I think this is working. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me at the back? Because I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. But before I say anything, I am, I want to say a word for IMA. It is after 28 years I am coming to a national management convention of IMA. 
after 28 years, nearly three decades. The last time I was here, ours was the team that won national competition for young managers. And I'm sure that in this team, there, uh, this group, there must be people who are winners of this year's national competition for young managers. And uh, I really want to give you a thumbs up because IMA has been one platform that has really, really helped me evolve from where I was to where I am today. So, congratulations to those who are... Uh, Definitely a big inspiration to many in the audience. Absolutely. So, that's why I thought that for the youngsters, this was just a word for the youngsters. Now, coming to this predictability of policy, predictability of anything, how do you want to make the world predictable in a world which is now defined by VUCA? Volatility, uncertainty, <laughs> you know, you, complexity, ambiguity. These are the words that actually define our word, world. Now, even policies, if they are enabling frameworks, they will be the products of yesteryears. The evolution of policies that are required are in a manner that there is a recognition of what is needed to unlock ourselves for the next step. As far as the obvious ones are concerned, they are there, but there are solutions and we have to now start working towards those solutions. For example, one of the greatest bottlenecks in this country has been land acquisition. And one of the greatest reasons for that is there is no clear title. Is there a solution to that? Now, the, today's world is a world of blockchain. How come we have not yet implemented the reforms in a way that blockchain becomes the way of an open ledger by which land ownership is determined? So, these enabling frameworks will automatically, just like the digital economy has automatically unlocked many, many new possibilities. Just like the world has become a more level playing field with the existence of internet. Just like the world has put everything on a single mobile phone uh, as a convergence where most of the business can get con uh, conducted through it. Our policies and programs remain the vestiges of the five-year plans. Our uh, policies and programs remain ensconced in that uh, not creating precedence. Unfortunately, I also had the uh, misfortune of living six years in UK and then I started respecting Indian bureaucracy because masters of bureaucracy sit there. They have taught us and I think policies are overrated. Opportunities are what are getting created by the people. Since 1991, when Dr. Manmohan Singh uh, really opened up the economy and we had India's economic freedom after so many years. And with all the digitalization of the economy, all the Nandan Nilekani's work of uh, Aadhaar cards, which is now utilized very well by this uh, government, all these are the enabling infrastructures that are putting power in the hands of the people. Policies are not going to stop this juggernaut from moving. That is what I am saying. So, keep seeking out the opportunities. Don't dwell so much on the policy part of it. They will have to follow. They will have, they to, will follow. have to follow. Political will has to subordinate to people's will. Right. Uh, Mr. Mukundan, do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think broadly one would tend to agree. And I also think uh, in terms of the uh, ability to deal with complex issues going forward, I think we need to build capabilities. I'm not talking about the capabilities of the past. For example, in a, in, a, in, a, in a regime where intellectual property is going to be very highly regarded as one of the key value creators, how many of our, let's say, legal experts and how much of our, let's say, uh, people who work on that space understand intellectual property well? The capacity in those new areas, emerging areas, is something we need to build. So I'm not saying every ro road is completely clear. More than, so policies in things like AI, policies, things like uh, cyber privacy and stuff like that, these will play a bigger role going forward. When you speak about infrastructure, uh, I, I really think we have to build differently. For example, when you talk about uh, land acquisition as an issue, we may be needing distributed power systems going forward. 
which is completely different from what we what others have built. So I, I, I think we, 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 we need to sort of say that policy issues in the traditional areas may be getting fixed, but we need to proactively anticipate the policy issues which we need to deal with in new areas which are emerging and also build capabilities there. So it is not that we don't have tasks to be done, but there is tasks to be done really on the areas which we haven't done so far. Right. Uh, Mr. Goswami, thank you for waiting patiently. I was just uh, getting the debate completed as far as policy predictability goes. But do you see any structural issues with the economy that need to be addressed urgently on a priority basis? Thank you. Um, I'm going to make four quick points in part answering your question. The first is a resounding positive, which is that between now and another five or six years, uh, so the third term of Mr. Modi, which is almost certainly going to be the third term of Mr. Modi, uh, the five, for the next five or six years, um, I would find it very difficult to see this economy uh, growing, at, not growing at an average of 6% per annum. I mean, 6% real per annum, maybe even 6.2% for the next five or six years. Um, after that, one shouldn't speak because, you know, economists love to be clairvoyants, but they shouldn't be. Okay. But I'm going to raise three issues which are, which are far removed from the world that you are all in here, but are going to be absolutely critical for India as we go forward. The first is a, you know, we talk about this great demographic dividend. Actually, and I'm going to be blunt, it's a demographic nightmare. There is a huge mass of people, young people, and that mass is increasing simply because of the demographic push. Many, many, a very large percentage of which I won't bore you with statistics are simply unequipped to be employed. Consequently, you are actually seeing a larger and larger pressure of unemployment and underemployment taking place in India. You will not see it here, but if you just move around, you will see a large number of un underemployed people, all of whom are seeing how the better off live, but are not getting the benefits of employment, getting the benefits of jobs. And this, to my mind, is one of the... It has nothing to do with Mr. Modi. It is, it is a long period of not focusing on what we should have focused on. But it is a huge challenge going forward with very, very large numbers. The second challenge is our complete and total failure of education. This is a long-term process. The failure started with Jawaharlal Nehru. Forget about the IITs. But basically, we failed in primary and secondary education and high school education. Now, consequently, this large mass of people who are in the school and early college going age are simply not, most of them are not educated enough to deal with a fundamental change that is taking place, which is digitization and artificial intelligence. So we, this is our second problem. Huge mass of people, inadequate education, massive technological changes taking place, and the inability to deal with it. And the third challenge is this. No advanced country in the world, no, capital N, capital O, no advanced country in the world has become advanced without a large percentage of women in the workforce. It has never happened. You take any advanced country and you'll find the percentage of women in the workforce is very high, relatively high or very high. India not only has a low percentage of women in the workforce, but over the last 15 years, that percentage has been going down. It was 35%, it's gone down to below, it's gone down to about 23, 24%. You can discuss the numbers, but the fact is it's going down. And if we continue like this, 
it is not possible to get to being an advanced country you need many more women many more women with capabilities joining the workforce and this is the three things so one six percent six and a quarter percent for the next six years no question whatsoever no problems but there is a huge problem of unemployment and under, uh, underemployment which is now showing up in the urban landscape okay second is the failure of our education a long long term failure and the more so in the age of artificial intelligence and digitization and the third is the abysmal failure of having women in the workforce i think if we don't take care of these none of this is because of this government it's a long term failure in policy long term failure of uh, not just policy but also action uh, but if we don't take care of these then the cancer will be growing it will still grow but the cancer will be growing amongst us i'll stop here thanks right uh, mr goswami you raised some very very important points about the gender gap about underemployment about unemployment in general my follow up question to that today we're talking about making india a semiconductor hub in future uh making india a hub for generative ai this is extremely important for transformation of companies how do we ensure that we have the right skill sets one of the reasons why companies have been slow to invest in the semiconductor scheme is because right now you don't have an ecosystem and the right skill sets you don't have sets. employment you don't have people skill sets you yeah. don't have the skill sets to start a large semiconductor uh, facility so how do we overcome that <laughs> work on education we right now we'll have to overcome it by importing people uh, but we don't have the skill sets we need the semiconductor hub but we don't have the skill sets and we have to import people right okay. yeah i have a slightly different take on the world probably i am far more bullish about the world today than i was even a decade ago the fact of the matter is that today education cannot be on the same basis as it used to be earlier today education is far more democratized it is available and ai to my mind is not going to be artificial intelligence that change changes our way of educating ourselves but it is going to be the augmented intelligence i have myself been using chat gpt quite profusely the reason is very simple what i cannot fathom to collect from the world and my education was based on how much can i cram in my head today i don't have to cram things in my head in fact uh, ronnie in the morning uh, said the right thing we don't need problem solvers we need problem spotters we need people who are able to ask the right questions and augmented intelligence gives us far greater power in our hands to be able to do something the other day we were trying to figure out uh, uh, my wife was doing something and she said that how do i make a panic door okay let's ask chat, chat gpt and the full description of how to make a panic door was there and she handed it over to to the designer i think we are in a completely different world than where we used to be as far as women in workforce is concerned i think whether it is women or men we have to start first of all recognizing that not all paid work is valuable work and not all valuable work is paid work or economically recognizable work i think women in workforce are always there but men in workforce are always there let's start recognizing that first when i am a product of a woman who has been a homemaker and i owe a lot of my education to her i know uh, i have a lot of my cultural underpinnings owed to her it is an insult to the women who are homemakers to be called as not participating in the economy i'm sorry i don't accept it it's not something that i will accept thirdly as far as our way of under employment is concerned time for employment as defined earlier in fact 
it was in 1971 that alvin toffler published his bo book future shock and at that time he had said death of the organization man he had talked about death of the organization man half a century later those words are coming true there are more and more people who are going to be employed on their own terms on the basis of their own skills and probably they are going to create jobs that did not even exist in the yester years think of how many people are now earning by just putting their skills on the internet through youtube etc and they are the ones who are really earning sitting at home there is a different world we are living in we cannot any longer blame anybody be it the government be it the society be it anybody all that we need to educate our children is how to leverage this power which is which has created a level playing field a flat world in our hands and how to be prepared to grab the opportunities that will come our way as we go along right uh, those are some inspiring messages from mr jha but at the same time we need a greater involvement of women in parliament the women's reservation bill is an example of that we need a greater involvement of women in policy making in boardrooms and in uh, all aspects of manufacturing as well uh, mr mukundan if i were to ask you what is the road map for that every company is today talking about it today we've spoken about a women's reservation bill in parliament which will possibly become a reality in 5 to 7 years from now but when it comes to a road map for greater gender parity greater gender parity in boardrooms what's the what's the mantra for that for the future yeah i i i think the first step in the mantra is to say uh you know what exactly i heard as a point here is a you uh, regard to my friend here pimlendra you know it's easy to say you know uh, we respect all forms of work then i challenge the men why don't you do homework and let the women work how many how many men would take that up but it's a different point L let me come to this point you know i l let me speak with data and statistics for the first time in schools and in colleges the undergrad ratio of uh, students the women have crossed the men yeah. there are more women coming out of the colleges today than men yes and it will be very difficult forget about policies and reservation it will be very difficult for you to f sort of when you when you go out and interview people if the same talent is there you will end up recruiting people because they are now available and it's coming through this and this is the latest data and this has been there for last 5 years we actually flipped the men actually have, are underperforming than women in all parameters of higher education now and it's matter of sort of giving them the yeah. confidence that they can come and work in the workforce second is that in my own company uh, last two batches of gets we have got more women than men and it used to be a point that you know they will not stay but they are staying now they are making their spouses to come to their place of work and this happened for the first time in a place called babrala which is in up which used to be our plant so if you think a, a place where things want change has completely started to change there are indicators of change but let me go back to address the issue which i think omkar has raised and very uh, very important points we need to address them in my view i think there are three issues india needs to focus on to deliver on the opportunity which is out there number one i think we need to focus on scale whatever we do we need to do it at scale for example the issue we have is that we've got a hall like darbar hall can delhi have hundreds such darbar halls for conferences for meetings of the same standard the second thing we need to sort of uh, you talk about bharat mandapam where we had the g20 I, that's a different scale altogether so we are beginning to think of scale we are building scale in railways we are building scale fastest electrification in the world has been done by indian railways and i can see that as a fact what we can deliver on the ground build the roads we have built so infrastructure is getting built but we must continue to build at scale and not just run away because you know if you think 5 6 years will not build scale if you think let's say 30 years 40 years will build scale and it's very important the second piece in, the, in that is we need to have standards we will be plugged into the global supply chain and if we don't adhere to standards we will not be able to sort of uh, embrace the opportunities out there and standards are going to be important in every sphere Be and that ai or energy or including education emissions. including everything you will have standards and when you talk about education you know one of the big success stories in asia is vietnamese school education 
what they have done to incentivize school teachers and the infrastructure exactly what Onkar mentioned in terms of the primary, secondary. I think I think that yeah. we need to address and fix. So these are fixable problem and this the basic skills you learn when you're together in a closed environment are not going to come through a Zoom a screen or a digital screen. They're going to come from a different level of point. And uh, lastly, I think we need to focus. So I spoke about three things we need to do. Scale, standards, and the last one I think is the one which we are trying to fix, but we're finding it extremely difficult. And that one is called like, skills. Skills is not same as education. Skills are ability to do things which are very practical. And for example, I, I didn't know till I joined one of the skill sector councils, we have shortage of security guards because we don't have enough skilled security guards who are certified. You can put a man at the door, but then a certified security guard is a very, very different person. The person understands the basics of what is there to secure the place, secure a perimeter, secure a, a, a property. So I, I think we, we need to focus, which is why again going back to standards and do it at scale. So these are three critical components. We are getting there, but have, have we done it? Is there an opportunity to improve? I, I think always there'll be an opportunity to improve. And do it faster as well. Uh, Mr. Goswami, I'd like to uh, follow up uh, with you. When we speak about Atmanir Bharta self-reliance, now this has been a major push from the government. We've got PLI schemes as well. We'll speak about life after PLI. But when you are betting for the future, do we need to choose the areas we want to focus on for the next 10 years, next 20 years, very carefully? No. Right. Straight answer, because whenever, whichever country has done that, have right royally screwed it up. No, you need to focus on where the entrepreneurship comes. You need to focus on where the energies of people are who are making goods and services. You have to get the best people in that. And it doesn't matter what you're producing. Anybody who says, these are the desirable things that we need to produce. I'll take them all, put them in a time machine and take them back to 1971 and say, welcome to the license control and permit route. No, uh, what I meant was there are always countries which are going to have some competitive advantage. That competitive advantage does not happen ex ante. It happens ex post. It happens because of education. It happens because of the universities. It happens because of where they started to focus on. Our problem was around the 70s, early 70s, all the great and glorious people hanging around in Delhi wearing bush shirts uh, decided that they knew what was best for India. And we suffered hugely because of that, hugely. And there is always, believe me, there you don't know, but in North Block, there are rooms with hidden almaris, almaras. <laughs> where every single bad decision, bad, de bad de uh, uh, debate or decision not taken is kept in the Almayras to take out and reuse again, okay? And at the heart of all these guys, barring a few, is how can I figure out a little bit more control? How can the guy come over and have a cup of tea with me in order to get an okay? No bribes, just to sit, and sit with me. No. We've gone through it, we've suffered, we've lost a minimum of 15 to 18 years of growth because of it. And thank you, no. Okay, uh, Mr. Mukundan, you, I think, wanted to come in on that. Uh, we're talking about the need for self-reliance. And of course, the need for self-reliance is great after COVID-19, after the Ukraine war. We need uh, strong supply chains here in India. But should we be manufacturing everything? Because if there is somewhere you can get something in a cost-effective manner from at a lower cost, shouldn't you do that and build your expertise somewhere else? What should be the definition of self-reliance for the future? Yeah, I, I think fundamentally, when you when you pick any any industry and you start thinking scale, you'll think differently. And that will huh. build, build self-reliance automatically. Huh. Let me just say this, with scale comes cost competitiveness, with scale comes ability to sort of get all the inputs and also you make the market when, when you really build that Absolutely. scale. So all these three things come together. But to think scale, you need to fundamentally remove the roadblocks and start imagining the future that you can serve everybody. So when Gandhi mentioned Sarvodaya Antayodhya, he was not mentioning in a very 
uh, that concept still works. If you if you build for 1.4 billion, you got a market right here, you, and you don't want to go anywhere else. The thing which I wanted to come 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 in was about the semiconductor. One of the biggest learning for me is that we did all the right things, but didn't follow through to scale them up. If you look at semiconductor complex, which was set up in Chandigarh, when generation generation that was two, in the eighties, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, when 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 Gen two, when Gen two was uh, the the generation two of electronics, India was already at par with the world, and when that whole thing got fire, somehow we didn't rebuild it again. And we lost track of it in the policy, my correct, whatever correct. we were in. So it's not that we have not thought ahead of the curve. It's about forgetting what we created an ambition for and not following it through. So similarly, when you talk about hydrogen economy, when you talk about digital AI, if you don't follow through on the promising opportunities, hmm. someone else will be supplying. On hydrogen, for example, I can tell you three countries top the world in competitiveness today measured hmm. by most research institutions, not practical. It's Saudi Arabia, Australia, and India. If we don't get our act together and we don't build scale, I don't think Saudis and Australians are waiting for us to sort of give us time. They are also building, so we need to build that scale. So, really, these opportunities do not let go. These are once in, uh, let's say, decadal opportunities, and we should embrace and push ahead. All right. Uh, I think we have some time for audience questions now. Can we have a? Uh, can we have some hands now? All right. Uh, I'll just take one or two questions which have already come to me for Mr. Goswami. Mr. Goswami, this is uh, from Dr. Ranjit Kumar. Uh, he's asked you, will the new national education policy address the long-lasting problem of failure of education? If yes, please highlight. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. Um, fr frankly, education is, is a far more difficult concept because uh, it is a state subject. It's very much a state subject. Some states have institutions that impart good educations. Many states do not have institutions that impart good education. And, um, and even within states, some districts do it very well, others don't. So um, I'm not sure about a national education policy delivering the goods. And even if it did in part, it will take time. I mean, look, we have, we will overcome. The great thing about India is India is superb in overcoming things. But, you know, this is a failure which is not a 5 or 10 year failure. This is a 30, 35, 40 year failure. It will take time. Thank you.